I'm about to tell you my revenue per thousand views. These are bananas numbers. Yeah, exactly. How many millions of views do you get per month? Well, on the total main channel we get. Okay. So you guys do the math. Europe's biggest tech YouTuber. He makes some of the most visually advanced tech content. Aaron Maney. Aaron Maney. Aaron Maney. Also known as Mr. Who's the Boss. Hi, I'm Aaron Maney, known on YouTube as Mr. Who's Boss. You've achieved something that I think a lot of us aspire to achieve. How many hours does it take to edit a video? Oh, for one of our videos, like weeks. <laughs> what? I didn't know what I was doing. You stand so close to the camera, you look like an idiot. And you just keep learning and learning and learning. What kept you going? I don't know if I can say this. And that's a metric that is kind of hidden. It turns out your studio is your bedroom. I spent the entire, like, 11, 12 years I've been making content in that room. And you can reach the world. It took me so many attempts to get you here. Thank you for he, coming. Uh, he swindled me with a lunch yesterday. <laughs> um, so, Arun, I, I want to... First of all, I want to... Um, I wanna, I, so I have some slides, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna make it very interactive for people to actually follow along with us, okay? So can you see my iPad? You'll see it very soon. Basically, I wanna talk about how to reach the world from your home because that is what you have achieved. You have been able to reach the entire world directly from your home in Nottingham. Yep. <laughs> how many people know where Nottingham is? It's not many. I don't know what Nottingham is. So for our talk today, I want to divide it into four categories, okay, guys? So you can follow along very clearly, okay? This is not just me and him. This is me and him and you. So we're going to talk about your personal story. We're going to talk about your choices and how you build your career because they're very unique. And I think you'll be inspired by them. And then we're going to talk about how you think about your content. And then we're going to talk about advice to the audience, okay? So, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you were a graduate. You were just like a lot of us. You were a university graduate. Tell me more about Not that. quite 10. I'm not that old. Okay, sorry. <laughs> six, so you're very fresh. Six years ago. Six years ago, yeah. So I did economics at university. What I tend to find is people naturally, unless they steer off the path that they're on by default, follow the option that just aligns to what their skills are good at. So like, I was just good at maths. So I was like, oh, I'll take an economics degree. You do the economics degree, and the next natural thing that you'll just end up on, unless we do something else actively, is you'll be a consultant. So I did an internship. That's you. Consultancy. That is me. I think I was late to something in that case. <laughs> so I was a consultant, and I did this eight-week internship. They offered me the job, and I had this dilemma on my hands because I had this YouTube thing. It was really exciting. It was very unstable. But then I had the office job, very stable, very certain. I could see my entire life ahead of me. And I picked YouTube, and it was the best decision I ever made in my entire life. But hold on, how much did that consulting job pay? Probably like 40K salary. Okay, and your parents were also at the same company, right? Like you had family at the same company. Yeah, my mom used to work at Pricewaterhouse when she was younger. So most of us would probably just do this for 20 years. Yeah. Why didn't you do it? Because one of them excited me. Um, I realized very early on that I had a passion for YouTube and you're, you're probably like, if you're here, you have that same passion. You realize because it, it fuels you. Like you come back, I used to come back from this work and then start my YouTube job in the evening, like 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. I just make videos. And that's how you know, you know, I was sitting there in the office thinking about the videos I was going to make when I got home. So that's how you knew. Yeah. So I actually was able to track down one of your earlier videos. No. <laughs> nine years ago, dude. Yeah. Nine years ago. And it's funny because a lot of us are in this stage now. If you don't have 15 million followers now, then you're probably in this stage. How, how, tell us about nine years ago. I didn't know what I was doing. Because uh, <laughs> to be honest, actually, this is what I thought YouTube was. I thought YouTube at that time, and I think this is what a lot of people think, is... You get up on stage and you present to the audience, right? You, you do a PowerPoint. But people, if they want a PowerPoint, they go to work. You don't want to be a worse version of work. You want to be the best version of you. And so you got to basically create a personal no, create personality, be yourself so that they can <laughs> connect to that personality. Tell us right? how you really feel. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the big thing I realized between now and then is people come to YouTube to connect with a person. Be yourself, be the real you, tell those stupid jokes that only you think are funny because that's actually what people are coming for. 
So you started this by being somebody else. Yes. You were trying to copy something or try to be formal, I assume. So I, if you haven't seen my videos, I work in the tech review space. And there's this kind of image of tech reviewers of like, it's very corporate, it's very formal. You know, there's a way of doing it. You've got to be professional. And so that's what I thought. You know, I created this white backdrop and I perfectly, well, in hindsight, not very well lit my face, but um, that's what I thought being a good tech reviewer was. But it was missing the soul. It was missing that personality. And it was only when I started making jokes and actually sitting down on camera and thinking, what do I actually want to talk about? What do I actually think is interesting about this product? And not following the formula of like, let's talk about the camera. Let's talk about the battery. Let's talk about this in this kind of formulaic manner. That's when the channel took off. Interesting. And to be clear, you actually care about reviewing gadgets and electronics. Like that is your passion. I'm really, yeah, I love, love technology, but it's also easy to suck the fun out of it if you start to think of it as a formula. Like, if you're actually doing what you want to do, people will see the joy in your eyes doing it. And, that, and that's how, that's why people come to YouTube. And what's amazing is that nine years ago you were this, and now you're like this. Wow. It's so amazing. And now you have the guts and the cojones to make your cover photo, <laughs> wanting to get more subscribers than Apple, a $3 trillion company. Do you think you'll get, you'll get there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how is, so in those like nine years from going like this to this, I feel like most of us would probably give up after three videos here. Like, what kept you going? So one thing that my economics degree really helped me with is it made me incredibly responsive to data, right? One of the beautiful things about YouTube is you have this massive data mine. Every single video you post, you get comments, you get likes, you get all the behind the scenes stats of what's going on. That is such an invaluable tool, right? So I was just driven by this data. I was looking at every video, looking at every bit of feedback and using that to make the next one better than the last. Someone tells me in the comments, oh, you stand so close to the camera, you look like an idiot. So there's always a useful bit of like a nugget hidden, even in the negative comments. Sometimes they're the most useful ones. And you just keep learning and learning and learning and trying to make every video better than the last. That, that's what drives me. So I guess you're saying is be attentive to the initial comments that we get. That if, if one video gets 3,000 views and another gets 6,000 views, do more of the 6,000 and less of the 3,000. And you said like, like, make actionable steps based on very small signals? Yeah, like if I started from the very beginning and I, I told myself, you know, one day my goal is 15 million, that's too daunting. That's not how you start. You start by saying, I want to get to a thousand, then I want to get to 2000. And you figure it out in that way and you learn way faster than you expect to if you pay attention to the, all the data you're getting. Interesting. Okay, so, so nine years later, uh, you, you, you've grown to be uh, pretty big, big enough for the CEO of Google to make a video with you. Uh, this was very recent, I believe. Yeah. Um, you know, big enough to win a streaming awards. I was at your house yesterday and you won a streaming. That's pretty cool. I don't know what a streaming is, but it looks fancy. Uh, <laughs> you get the YouTube diamond play. So you've, you've achieved something that I think a lot of us aspire to achieve. But I want to go deeper into how you did it because you did it in a very unique way. You did it all the way from Nottingham and you did it and, you know, people don't know this, you know, you did it first of all by focusing only on one platform, YouTube. You don't give two shits about Facebook <laughs> or Instagram. So walk us why, why YouTube only? So there's a few things with YouTube. I think the key reason that I was drawn to it was the fact that it's why people visit YouTube. If you compare it to TikTok, for example, people come to TikTok often to pass time. You're that little one minute snippet between they catch the next train and the one they've just come off. Whereas when someone's on YouTube, they're there purposefully to seek some, some other person to either learn from or have a laugh with. And so that allows the space for you to have a much deeper connection with your audience. So there's that. There's creator support. There's the fact that, you know, when you reach a certain size in YouTube, you get assigned a human. And you'll realize if you've tried working with like TikTok, it's impossible to find like a person who works at TikTok who actually will help you. Um, and then there's also the fact that monetization. So the fact that you're building on YouTube, these really long form, these deep connections with the audience, that becomes very fruitful in the monetization sense. 
uh, you'll find this interesting. So I actually got some stats earlier from my own channel. Oh, nice. Let's go. Yeah. So give us the deets. So TikTok. So the, I'm about to tell you my RPM. So the revenue per thousand views on TikTok. Can anyone guess? Actually, I'm curious. So what do you think TikTok is? Go on. What was that? One dollar. Okay. So TikTok is zero point zero zero five. Right. Uh, my YouTube shorts. Wait, hold on. That's five, not five cents. That's, that's not five cents. That's half a cent. Half a cent for a thousand views is what I'm getting. Um, YouTube shorts is quite a bit better than that. It's four cents per thousand views. That's eight times better. So have a guess what long form YouTube content is. Oh God, I don't want to guess. I will feel like shit if I get. Yeah. Okay, but it's not quite there. It's, <laughs> it's about seven, $7. Seven. That's RPM. So that's the average earning per thousand views, even across ones that aren't monetized. So the actual CPM will be $14, $15 because some views aren't monetized. Wow. So the actual difference is vast. And that all reflects in the fact that you're able to connect, create this connection such that people will be willing to watch two or three or four ads to be able to just listen to you. Hold on, seven dollars for long form, yeah. four cents for YouTube Shorts, yeah. and half a cent for so so it's like almost seven thousand times better. It's ridiculous, right? <laughs> to get, so you're making you're making seven thousand dollars for every one million views. So if a video gets five million views, you'll be making thirty five thousand dollars. These are bananas numbers, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but just. Like, Aaron, we got to give them a caveat. You are in a category that has money, which is tech products. If somebody now goes make travel content, that's not the RPM, correct? Yeah, I guess so. Um, you get some finance YouTubers who target these really, really specific wealthy niches. They hit $35 CPMs. Okay, yes. But context, context. Yeah. They get specific niche. They get $35 RPM, but they cannot get a million views because there's not a million people that are interested in this. 100%, yeah. So, so one of the kind of ongoing theories is you decide whether you want a breadth of audience but a shallower connection, or you want a really small audience but a really deep connection with them. And you've obviously gone for very broad. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, do you know how much I make from a one minute video? Do you know what the RPM is? I guess like 30 cents. Minus $4,000. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I lose money on every single video I make. And you make $7,000 for every 1 million views, which is a new average. I mean, like, we don't want to numbers, but like, how many millions of views do you get per month? Well, on the total main channel, we get 300 million. 300 million. Okay. So you guys do the math. Uh, some of those are shorts, so it's not all. Some yeah. of those are shorts. <laughs> okay. Um, but but that's, that's really fascinating that, yeah, that you chose YouTube. I think somebody in the audience is going to say, well, that's great, Mr. Who's the Boss, but YouTube long form is a lot more competitive than going viral on TikTok. I am a nobody right now. I don't care about the money. I need the people to know about me first, then I'll make the money. And that's why I need to go to TikTok, not YouTube long form. What do you say to that? Uh, I think that's a really sensible strategy. Um, I think if you're making short form content, you may as well be present on both YouTube shorts and TikTok. Just post on both. But it is a really good way to be known because... I mean, the, the benefit of a subscriber is mattering less and less. Like, I know we have this goal to overtake Apple. It's all really a vanity metric at this point. It's really how many people know your face, how many people know your personality, how many people connect with you. And that's a metric that is kind of hidden. But so long as you're getting impressions using these short form pieces of media, you're actually increasing that hidden statistic. Interesting. Okay, so that's one thing you did that's different from other creators. Most creators go every platform and go to Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and, and YouTube, and then see what works. But you said, I'm going to be a YouTuber, and it worked. The, the way I see it, YouTube is powerful enough that you can, once you have that captive audience, you can bring them with you to Twitter, to Instagram. You, you kind of know them well enough that they'll follow you. Okay, the next thing you did that is very unconventional which I was shocked when I saw it. Now we know the size of this guy, okay? He has Streamy Awards, he has CEO of Google, and he wants to overtake Apple with number of subscribers. Now, when I went to visit him in Nottingham, I expected a 100,000 square feet studio. And turns out your studio is your bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> 
within your parents' house. Yep. You live with your parents. Mm -hmm. In Nottingham. Yep. <laughs> Not even London. Not even London. Why? This is, this is the beauty of YouTube, right? It's the fact that everything we've ever done is in that room. Like my bed used to be where that desk is, where I sit right now. I spent the entire like 11, 12 years I've been making content in that room and you can reach the world. It's just, it's the beauty of it. And, and what I would say to you is there, there sometimes feels, you might feel the need to go out and get a studio, but like, don't rush on those things. Appreciate the fact if you have a family who looks after you, for example, enjoy it, right? Like love them and spend time with them. And uh, no one is going to not watch your video because you're in a bedroom. If anything, that makes you more of a real person. So, really amazing, because you and I are similar in so many ways, but different in so many other ways. I did the exact opposite. I escaped from my parents' house, and I've hired 90 people, and we have 14,000 square foot studios in, 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 in Dubai, right? So, I went that completely like anti-Mr. Who's the Boss approach, right? Yeah. But, 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 the, but the funny thing is, is that it works both ways. It's working for, for me. Otherwise, without having people, we wouldn't be able to host NAS Summit to help us do this. But also works for you uh, uh, to be just like a, a six-person team. And the revenue is the same. The revenues are almost the same. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the way I see it is um, you have to identify, um, like Aline was saying earlier, your ikigai, right? Your purpose. So I realized very early on, I am passionate about making tech videos. And it's the absolute jackpot, because for some reason, people want to watch it, right? So I've identified that there's something I like doing that creates value, that people find interesting, that is helping the world. I should be doing that. So each of my hires has come about from thinking, what parts of this job are me not doing that exact thing that I'm best at, that's creating the most value? And so it started off with an editor. And so for a lot of people in this room, you may be hesitant to be like, oh, I can't quite afford an editor right now. I actually got my first editor before I could afford to pay him. No. Um, yeah, because if we carried on making the ad revenue I'd made in that year that I'd hired him, I would have had to like take a loan or something to pay him. Wow. But I realized that having him on was going to allow me to spend twice as much time doing the thing that creates the most value. And therefore that year we made five times as much. And wow. so that's how we got very quickly to like a six, seven person team. We haven't really gone beyond that because to create YouTube content at this point, I've become the limiting factor. There's only one of me. Um, but as soon as I identify I'm doing lots of things that I don't want to be doing again, we'll be yeah. hiring. So your recommendation is if you are anywhere near some sort of success or maybe some sort of signs of success, try to buy back your time 100%. because editing takes six hours per day. To make, how, how many hours does it take to edit a video? Oh, for one of our videos, like weeks. <laughs> what? We, we do a lot of editing. Weeks? Yeah, a long time. That's insane. Yeah. So it makes sense to get an editor because you buy back time and you focus on the business. Now, let's, let's move on. I mean, this is also your house. Like everything that you shot on your videos is from your house, which shocked me because if you look at his content, it looks really like he has like 50 houses to shoot content in. But I want to understand... How do you think about the video you make? Who is the viewer? So I think one of the misconceptions when people make videos is if I just make what I want to make, people will watch me. It's true that you have to find a niche that you're interested in, but you have to think about the audience first. Because in a sense, you're paying, like you, your product is being consumed by the viewer. They're, they're paying with their time, right? It's like a service transaction. So... Whenever I make videos, do you have the slide with the three people? Yes, I do. Nice. Okay. So I think about three people. Whenever I write every single line in my scripts, I think about my sister, I think about my fiance, and I think about my mom. Um, and that's because... Amazing. <laughs> beautiful people. The, these people have three different levels of uh, humor, three different levels of tech understanding. And so every line I write... I'm telling myself, if each of these three people would understand it, if each of these three people would find it funny, then that's a good line. That, that needs to stay in the video. And so it, it allows me to see my own content from the viewer's perspective. Um, the other thing I would say to that is the personality. So don't forget to be yourself, say those stupid jokes. And the last thing is universes. So have you guys watched uh, Marvel? Has anyone here watched the Marvel movies? 
Yeah? You like them? Do you ever find, because I find this, that you'll tend to watch all the movies in one go, even the ones you don't really want to watch, because they're contributing to a wider universe? Right? So, like, this is me for, like, Captain America. Can't stand the guy. But, like, I watch all the films because they're contributing to a bigger picture. And this is what you need to think about with your audience, which is that you're creating your own universe, right? Your own set of inside jokes, people who know you. And they feel, if they feel like they know you and they feel like they're following your life story, which is essentially each of your videos in an episodic nature, you're like the main character in a movie universe. And that creates this feeling with the viewer that I can't miss a video. Um, you know, they'll, if you say an inside joke, then the people who really know you will feel rewarded for having invested themselves in your universe, right? They'll write in the comments, ah, did you see that funny thing? And mm -hmm. the people who don't know will see that comment and they're like, wait, what thing? I want to know that too. And they'll, they'll, they'll follow your story from the very beginning. And so that's something I actually learned from Marvel and something we've started doing in our videos. And what's an example that you did in your videos? Uh, so for example, one thing we do in ours is we, we hide a Rick roll in our videos. A what? Secret little reference, like Rick Astley. It's an internet joke. Oh, the Rick roll. Rick yeah. roll. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that guy. So we try and find more and more subtle ways to hide Rick Astley in our videos. And it becomes this game with the subscribers where they've got to spot the Rick. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So every single video you have a Rick roll in it. Yep. In like a split second. Could be, yeah. And people just watch the video until they find it and put it in the comment section. A hundred percent, yeah. That's really smart. But it's an evolving story because one day we've told ourselves we're going to get Rick himself on the channel. And so imagine how you'd feel as a subscriber, having followed me for like two years, seen every single Rick roll leading up to this pinnacle moment, right? It's pretty, it's pretty exciting. I love that. Yeah. Something similar that Nas Daily did was the ending line. That's one minute. See you tomorrow. What's happening tomorrow? I need to know. Or that's one minute, see you tomorrow in Morocco. Or I want to follow the journey to see where he goes next. So, so I, I noticed that the thousand day journey is like people were invested in it. Mm -hmm. So what you say, like kind of also Ryan Trehant, the YouTuber, he did a 30 day challenge to live on one cent. And that got insane attention. So episodic, continuous series of content does well. Yeah, a hundred percent. But it doesn't need to be episodic in the kind of like, this is season one, this is season two. Yeah. It's automatically episodic because it's someone following your journey. Yeah. Okay. We're running out of time. Now let's talk about the audience. What is your advice to the people sitting here about to start their career? And probably 90% of them want your level of success. Uh, as well as everything we've said, probably the one thing I would take away is quality over quantity. So we're already in an age where like, there is far more content produced on the planet that any viewer could possibly consume in their lifetime. So you're not going to stand out by flooding the internet with just, I don't know, just you rambling on. Like, really think about what makes you special and make content that takes advantage of that. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. I want to have two questions. Open room for two questions. Uh, stand up and like, be excited. Let's see. What's an interesting question? Uh, oh, you. Go. Scream. Okay, so to summarize the question, you're, you said niching down, but your niche is too small because it's only for international students and there's not millions of them. So how do you grow from there? I would say do a test. Test a different kind of video that you think you would rather make or that appeals to a broader audience. Um, I actually very recently started to think my niche was smartphones because for the longest time, all we were covering were smartphones. And then one time I was like, oh, I really like gaming. I want to make a PlayStation video. It's probably going to do badly. It was like our best performing video of the last three months. So you never know. So you're saying like test different videos about different lanes. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Okay, so don't constrain yourself too much, basically. Okay, uh, let's go back there. That guy, yeah. Scream. Uh, it's something... I'm not actually the representative to talk about this, but I know YouTube is testing like a multiple language tracks feature um, because I think, I don't know if I can say this, I think what YouTube wants is for like a certain person to be one channel and that be the place where you find everything for that person on. So they're trying to integrate it so that people don't have to create a separate shorts channel and a separate Urdu channel and so on and so forth. So if it was me, I would probably stick to one channel and hope that the rollout happens soon. Maybe ask a YouTube representative when it will happen. 
But his question is, what language should he speak? What language should come out of his mouth? That's a very personal question. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll give you my answer because I think about this as well. Um, I think it's about supply and demand. If you make a video in Arabic, there's very little supply of Arabic content creators and there's a big supply of English content creators. So you're much more likely to succeed in local languages because you have no competition. English is the hardest and the most competitive language. So, uh, uh, but there's, there's more money in it and there's less money in this. So what we do at Nas Daily, we speak English, but we translate to 13 languages using subtitles and dubbing into different channels uh, because it's not YouTube. So it doesn't, doesn't matter as much. But my recommendation is if you have an accent in English, it may be a little bit more difficult to go as viral as somebody with such a beautiful British accent. You know, it becomes really competitive. And so that's why I would probably go to like a local language and become the best at that local language. Uh, nothing wrong with that either. Uh, anyway, we're out of time. <laughs> yeah. Arun, thank you so much for doing this and keep up the great work. Where, what, what should we expect from you next, in the next five years? Oh man, well, let's overtake Apple, then we'll figure out who's next. And you just got engaged. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you for doing this. Pleasure. Wait, let's take a picture. Let's take a picture. Oh yeah, nice. Everyone smile. Cool. Love it. Thank you guys. I hope it was Cheers. helpful. Have a good one. Subscribe for more sessions of Nas Summit from around the world.